I'm going to talk about variable fonts, and before I jump into it, how many of you have heard of variable fonts or used them? Okay, just a handful. If you're not sure, chances are you haven't run across them. So I'm going to jump right into it by talking about static fonts, which are the fonts most of you are probably familiar with and are using day to day. And just normal fonts that we use, you think about how they're designed and how they're built, and each glyph is a fixed design in the font world. These are called outlines. So the glyph has an outline like the character N here, capital N, where it's just a geometry defining a polygon. And you may see a font with different styles, regular, bold, bold italic, you know, um, semi-bold, et cetera. Each one of those is a separate geometry. Each style is a collection of glyphs with their own geometries. And there's just lots of duplication across all those, those style, or all those uh, different styles. And applications kind of hide this from you. They'll show the font family name, and then they'll show the styles as a selection, and they make it look like you're using one font and just flipping between different styles. That's not really the case. They're actually different fonts. What are variable fonts? Variable fonts change this whole world, and the official name is Open Type Font Variations, and they were uh, ratified in, in 2016 by a group of software companies, Microsoft, Google, Apple, and Adobe. Basically, some folks at Google were looking at fixing a series of problems. They looked at an approach Apple had used in the 90s, and they kind of formed this whole group together to develop open type font variations. There are two types of open type fonts. There are .otf fonts, and true type fonts, .ttf fonts, can also be open type enabled. And variable fonts allow for a single font to have more than one axis of variation. I'll talk in the future about what an axis of variation is. But you can have a font that morphs itself into different representations. And then specific combinations of these variations can be set as named instances. And those named instances will be shown in applications so you can select regular and bold and narrow and things like that. The benefit of this is smaller sizes of fonts. And that's especially important in these days when wanting to create really great products on the web, where we're downloading web fonts and we want those to be as small as possible but still have a lot of variation. So you can have one single font file for light to very heavy font styles. The other advantage for us, which we might be interested in, is lots of individual control. So font, variable fonts allow you to control a lot of different things. Okay, we'll jump into the axes. Um, the open type specification defines five registered axes. These are weight, width, optical size, italic, and slant. Um, weight and width are pretty self-explanatory. Optical size is actually a concept brought back from the metal type days, and you can think of that as, um, as type gets smaller, we actually have to drop detail, because we couldn't actually print it. So now we're bringing that concept back into digital fonts, and it, it's, it's quite nice. Um, italic, in this sense, is basically just a Boolean. I'm either italic or not, and then I vary from that. In practice, it's not used that often. Slant is for creating oblique fonts. That's just taking the glyph and skewing it. Now, font designers can create custom axes, and when they define those, they have a different convention. So I have the short names for all the registered axes. They're all short names that are lowercase. If you create a custom axis, they'll be all caps. And that's because they're registering lowercase for future registered axes. OK, here's an example of a variable font, bond shrift. It has two axes, weight and width. And you can see the variation across the top. We're getting heavier in weight. And along, you know, top to bottom, we're getting narrower in width. Now, if each one of these was a traditional static font, each A would be from a different font file. Now, with variable fonts, they're just variations of a single font. And you can see the animation down at the bottom, you know, animating a weight change, animating a width change. 
Now, how are these built? Here's an example from the source serif font. Now, the outline is the uh, outline I showed earlier for N for a static font. It looks like just a single polygon. For the variable font, the outlines get really funky because we've actually chopped up all the bit. You can see the serifs are all separated and then you have the stems and that, that cross in the end. And in the construction of the font itself, you define anchor points and where the growth is and things like that. But you can see when we change weight, uh, the center part of the N is actually growing at a faster rate than the stems. So there's a lot of individual control here uh, with the weight growth. Okay, I want to talk about file size and, and the advantages here. Here's an example of um, one of the Noto Sans fonts. And you can see that the weighted version is larger, uh, the weighted variable version. Uh, it's, you know, 262 kilobytes. But if you were to make a map or a web page with just regular and bold, it's smaller than two of them combined. So you get an advantage. And if you were to use more of these weights, uh, you just save even more on, uh, on size. OK, where to find uh, variable fonts? Increasingly, you'll see them in all of our, uh, our font libraries, um, Adobe fonts, Google fonts. Uh, font, font foundries are producing more and more of these variable fonts. I like to go to a web page, v-fonts.com. It has over 350 variable fonts that you can actually interact with. So those of you who have your laptops today can just go to that site and, and play around. Um, and there's a, there's a growing open source uh, you know, font um, world, and more and more of the open source fonts are variable. Adobe Illustrator comes pre-deployed with several fonts. Um, Adobe is a little bit hesitant to declare variable fonts mainstream, so they call them all concepts. Um, if you're using a Mac, SF Pro in New York have variable versions. Um, all supported versions of Windows have um, a font bond shift, which I showed earlier. That was deployed pretty early on in Windows 10, and you'll see that you know, in Windows. And then Microsoft Office has just announced that they are deploying new default fonts, and they will have variable versions. Okay, the next part is, will these work in my application? There's kind of a couple levels of support for whether or not your application supports variable fonts. The first one is, for legacy applications that have never heard about variable fonts, no formal support. They might work, they might be kind of half broken. Um, you'll see a lot of applications just support named instances, because that's fairly easy to support. And then sort of the third tier here is some applications, especially on Windows, only support the .ttf versions of open type fonts, and they'll support named instances and custom variations. And then lastly, there's full support, both font format types, named instances, custom variations, and everything. So that v-fonts site also has a list of applications that support variable fonts. You can go and look at that. That's updated pretty regularly. Um, one thing to note is if you're going to use variable fonts and then you're going to an output format, that output format might not support them. So PDF famously does not support variable fonts. Adobe has a set of guidelines about how applications are supposed to produce the font from the variations and write it to PDFs. All right. And why am I talking about variable fonts today? It's because we introduced them in ArcGIS Pro and I was on the team that did that. We introduced them in ArcGIS Pro 2.7, so that was, was quite a while back. Um, and we have full support for both the TrueType um, open type font and the, the OTF open type font. And this is available with font controls on the ribbon, panes, and even formatting tags where you can fully control the, the variations. When you're looking for variable fonts in ArcGIS Pro, you'll note that they're um, indicated with a small V on the icon that tells you that it's variable, and then more UI lights up when you select a variable font. So ArcGIS Pro UI example here, we're just changing the weight of a text graphic on layout, and you can see that it updates um, immediately there. Uh, similar control exists in panes if you're, if you're updating text symbols in panes. 
In Illustrator, very similar controls. This is a different font with more variations and some custom axes. Um, you update you know, via this extra text control that's available in Illustrator when you select a variable font. And then I have an Inkscape example. This is not animated. Uh, the Inkscape pattern is a little bit more choppy because they don't do a dynamic update um, of the text changes. So you can change the weight and width, but you have to press apply every time you do it, and it's a little bit slow. Okay, so future things. We expect more applications to support variable fonts over time, and then most font foundries are transitioning to creating variable fonts, and you'll see variable fonts created by default. And then we're seeing more and more projects um, that are headed in the direction of solving and using variable fonts to solve a host of problems we've had with the font community. If any of you are making worldwide internationalized maps, you might know that you can't store um, more than 64,000 glyphs in a font, therefore you can't handle all of Unicode. Uh, there is work going on to uh, resolve that issue. And um, with variable fonts, there's a lot of opportunities for even minimizing the size further by sharing some of the primitive aspects that build um, glyphs in our, in our fonts. So before I break out here, I'm gonna jump over to the browser and show you v-fonts.com, this site, and just some examples here. Um, here's a, a grotesque font here. Oh, what happened? Sorry about that. Is it coming? There we go. Here's a grotesque font, and I can change the weight here. One of the things I really like about variable fonts is we can get back to very thin line work. We kind of lost that in the, the polygonization of glyphs. So we can go from very wide to very, very, very uh, light weight width, or lightweight um, fonts. Uh, this is also an example where I can change the slant for oblique, but I can change the direction, so I can have it go the other way. <laughs> so uh, I had a colleague, he's now retired, he said that back in the day when he did hand lettering, he always had the, the font lean in the direction of the flow of the river. And that is very difficult to do, but now maybe easier? I don't know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, here's another example. This is a case where it has the italic axes defined, and I'd say look at the Y, and I'm just gonna flip it over to italic, and you'll see, ooh, that went a little haywire. This web page is misbehaving, I think. Look at the Y, and you'll see the Y changes to an italic version. There we go. So um, if you want to lose an afternoon, just go to this web page, and there's 350-something fonts. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out was just app support. There's a big list of all the apps that support it in here, um, including all your graphics and you know, ArcGIS Pro, Illustrator, Photoshop, et cetera, on here. And that's it for me. Oh, we have time for questions, if anybody has any. Hold on one sec. I was just going to ask if you could put your slide deck URL back up. It's, it's on the Slack, actually. Oh, never mind then. Thanks. Um, unfortunately, the, uh, let's see. What is Harf Buzz? That's an interesting question. So the slide URL is on my speaker deck page there. Uh, Harf Buzz is the industry leading text layout engine. Uh, text layout is the, um, process of taking a string of characters and uh, producing the visual version of that that should draw. 
If you're uh, in English or uh, language based on the Latin alphabet, you're like, how is that hard? But it's actually quite difficult for things like Arabic, where you have to do contextual shaping and um, really analyze the full uh, piece of text to lay it out. And that's what HarfBuzz does. Um, ArcGIS Pro uses HarfBuzz. It's used quite a bit. And it's used in almost every browser you're using today. Um, it's a very commonly used library in the, in the, in the text world. Greg, the uh, font foundries charge a lot for the font families. Have uh, you seen any insight into how the variable fonts, variable fonts will be charged? Uh, so in terms of cost, I haven't. Um, there's definitely more of a push towards open sourcing fonts. And um, font licensing and costs is kind of a, it's a messy world. And that's why you'll see more and more companies creating their own fonts. And that's because it's cheaper to hire a font designer to make your own font than it is to pay licensing fees every year, which is kind of weird. Um, but I would like to see you know, one price, maybe then cheaper than buying that whole family. But creating variable fonts is pretty complex too. So maybe they want to recoup some of that cost. So, all right, thank y'all. Uh, come find me if you have any more questions or want to talk about ArcGIS Pro. Thank you, Craig.